I have some predictions that I'd like to make as we fix our gaze squarely on this upcoming year. I predict that in 2016, racial tension in this country will increase dramatically. Racial justice issues will enter our news cycles in even greater frequency than 2014 or 2015. And white Americans, liberals and conservatives alike, are going to struggle mightily with how to respond. And I'd like to add personally, I believe these are good and needful developments. Please understand, I am not predicting a greater occurrence of newsworthy racially discriminatory incidents occurring across our country in 2016. What I am suggesting is that all Americans, black, white, brown, all of us are becoming more and more aware of the insidious and systemic racism that continues to plague our nation, that continues to oppress people of color. My prediction that all Americans will become increasingly aware of the systemic racism in 2016 is a decidedly tame prediction. I am merely predicting that 2016 will follow a general pattern of conscientization that began nearly a decade ago. Now, the term conscientization was coined by social scientists in the 1960s. It's a fancy word for a relatively simple concept. It is the process by which a group is made aware of social and political conditions as a precursor to challenging inequality. In other words, it is the process of oppressed peoples waking up and seeing for the first time or in a new light the chains that bind them. Across the country, this process is happening right now among young black Americans. You can see it happening in real time on social media. Now, you won't find it by looking for hashtag conscientization. <laughs> but you will find it if you look at hashtag W-O-K-E, woke. As in millions of black Americans being awoken from a slumber, from a dream. What dream might that be? The dream that America, after hundreds of years of slavery and decades of Jim Crow, had entered a post-racial age. Some believe that this conscientization began only a few years ago. Many point to the Black Lives Matter or BLM movement, which was birthed in 2013 after a nearly all white jury found George Zimmerman not guilty of murdering unarmed black teenager Trayvon Martin. BLM then gained considerable velocity in 2014 after St. Louis County Prosecutor Robert McCulloch hid behind a puppet grand jury to avoid indicting the police officer who killed Michael Brown, another unarmed black teenager. But I believe there is scientific evidence that actually points to a different trigger point. According to Gallup, around 2004, 68% of black Americans said race relations in this country were either somewhat good or very good. Now the following year, it declined to a statistically significant 62%, and the next year it declined again to 55%. In another Gallup poll in 2005, blacks expressed satisfaction with society at 41%. The next year, it dropped to 37%, and the following year, it dropped to 30 Other polls found similar results, and most researchers believe the only reason we saw these numbers temporarily bounce upward in 2008 was because of the presidency of Barack Obama. So the question is, what happened in 2005 that could have created such a startling, statistically significant decline in optimism among black Americans that we as a nation were moving toward a post-racial society. I see some of you nodding your heads already. You know Hurricane Katrina. Of course, Katrina itself was not the catalyst. Rather, it was the nation's response to Katrina. Most everyone now agrees that the federal government's response to Katrina demonstrated a historic level of ineptitude. But in the days and weeks following Katrina's landfall, as Americans attempted to make meaning of this catastrophe that killed 1,800 people, 
and displaced thousands upon thousands more, we began as a nation to see two divergent narratives develop. To quote Slate journalist Jamal Bowie, white Americans saw the storm and its aftermath as a case of bad luck and unprecedented incompetence that spread its pain across the Gulf Coast regardless of race. To black Americans, however, this wasn't an equal opportunity disaster. To them, it was confirmation of America's indifference to black life. We remember the images. Poor black residents begging for help from rooftops. Black bodies floating through the streets. And what was the media's response in the aftermath of Katrina? Perhaps you recall the repeated use of the word refugees to describe black Americans, black citizens fleeing the devastation. Perhaps you recall that AP photo showing a young black man wading through chest high water holding a case of soda with a caption that read, looting a grocery store. Perhaps you also remember a similar AFP photo showing a white couple in the same situation with a caption that read, finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. Perhaps you remember Bill O'Reilly on Fox News calling the poor in New Orleans, quote, drug addicts, quote, thugs, clearly suggesting they all deserved what they got. They deserved what they got right there. That is the pernicious little lie that has allowed systemic racism to continue to flourish in our nation over these past several decades, even after Brown v. Board, even after the Civil Rights Act, even after the Voting Rights Act. It is that little lie that created a cloak of invisibility around racist structures and policies so they could not be seen for what they truly are. It is that little lie that eroded centuries of black solidarity, turning black Americans against each other. It's the lie that beguiled many of us into believing America had reached a post-racial age. It is the lie that lulled so many of us to sleep. This essentially is the thesis of this book. The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. Ms. Alexander is a civil rights lawyer and a former professor at Stanford Law. I know many of you have already read this book. It was the UUA Common Read for 2013. I'm about to say something about this book that I rarely say so please do not take my words lightly. I believe every Unitarian Universalist has a religious and moral duty to read this book. I believe this book should be required reading for all United States citizens. If you have not already done so, I am literally begging you this morning, pick up this book and read it. For this morning, I will attempt very briefly and unskillfully to summarize a couple of its conclusions and relate a few statistics. Alexander argues that systemic racism did not end following the civil rights movement. Racism simply changed its shape. It adapted to its new surroundings in order to survive. Following the civil rights movement, following the success and sacrifices of leaders like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Explicit racial animus moved towards extinction, but racial discrimination, exploitation, oppression, and marginalization, the American racial caste system, it continued, albeit veiled in allegedly colorblind government and private sector policies, which served to insulate these policies from accusations of racial bias. The clearest and most destructive example of these racist but nominally colorblind initiative is the war on drugs and the multi-billion dollar American prison industrial complex it has created. 
Now you see, I'm going to call them racist, racist policymakers in the 1970s and 80s obviously couldn't simply make it a crime to be black. So they did the next best thing. They declared a war on drugs and through selective enforcement of new anti-drug laws devastated black communities by turning legions of young black men into felons. This in turn, in many jurisdictions across this country, stripped black men of the ability to ever vote, to ever hold a career, to ever sit on a jury, to receive public assistance for housing or food, and place them under perpetual government surveillance. By turning legions of black men into felons, the United States of America was able to relegate millions of black people to second-class citizen status, the resurrection of old Jim Crow. These are strong, strident arguments. Here is the strong evidence to support them. In 30 years, under the war on drugs, the US prison population has exploded from 300,000 to over 2 million. The United States currently has the highest rate of incarceration in the world, more than Iran, more than Russia, more than China. And the U.S. prison population is astoundingly, disproportionately black. Today, more black men are under state correctional control than were enslaved in 1850. In the year 2000, Human Rights Watch noted that in seven states, 80 to 90% of drug offenders in prison were black. In at least 15 states, blacks are admitted to prison on drug charges between 20 to 57 times more than whites. Let me explain this math real fast. I didn't say 20 to 57% more. I said 20 to 57 times more. In other words, in these states, for every white man sent to prison for drugs, there are between 20 and 57 black men who go to jail for the exact same crime. And here is the absolute most important data for you to consider as you think on these numbers. Study after study has found that black and white Americans use illegal drugs at the same rate. In fact, some studies have shown that young white men actually use and sell illegal drugs at a higher rate than black men. The data is astoundingly clear. The idea that black people use or sell illegal drugs at a higher rate than whites is patently, provably false. Yet selective enforcement in black communities has created a false illusion that serves to justify and perpetuate itself. In 1995, a journal asked individuals to close their eyes and imagine a drug user. When asked to describe this imaginary drug user, 95% of respondents described a black person. This despite the fact that whites use illegal drugs at the same rate as blacks. And remember, of course, blacks only make up 15% of the general population, meaning only about 15% of illegal drug users are black. So then how does this false perception, this racial bias, affect the relationship between police and the black community? Here's a study a few years back from Maryland on a particular stretch of highway on I-95 outside Baltimore, they determined that 17% of the motorists were black. Yet when police randomly stopped drivers for random drug searches on this highway, 70% of those stopped were black. And ironically, more illegal drugs were found in the white cars than the black cars. The implicit bias of our police officers against black citizens, the selective enforcement of the drug war against blacks, the militarization of the police as a direct result of the drug war has led to increased and increasingly tense encounters between police and black citizens. It is no coincidence that a culture of police brutality against blacks exists in our country today. It is no coincidence that we are seeing an epidemic of extrajudicial killings of black citizens by police officers who are then exonerated by prosecutors who are dependent upon positive relations with the police in order to do their jobs. 
I'm running out of time this morning, so I will not be able to discuss at length how private investors have capitalized upon the mass incarceration of black men over the past several years, but it is worthy of note that there has been a proliferation of for-profit prisons in our country, which means that our government is using our tax dollars to pay capitalists to house prisoners. If you invest in private prisons, then contrary to the old axiom, crime really does pay. Because prisoners equals profit. Prisons across our country then pimp out cheap prison labor to companies, Wendy's, Victoria's Secret, Kmart, JCPenney, the list can go on, who pay wages as low as 25 cents an hour. And in addition to receiving cheap labor, these companies who employ prisoners also receive additional tax breaks from the government. Via mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex, we have quite literally recreated a form of race-based slavery in this country. But because we can conveniently label these slaves as criminals, we have deluded ourselves into believing that this is not a racist system because criminals get what they deserve. That is the great American lie that obfuscates the great American sin of racism. They get what they deserve. They're punished not because they're black, but because they're criminals. But the reason they have been labeled criminals is because they are black. And perhaps the saddest consequence of this lie is that it has splintered the black community turning black Americans against each other, upper and middle class black Americans against lower class black Americans. Black solidarity has been a foundational characteristic of the Amer African American struggle in this country for centuries, which is not to in any way discount the internal diversity of philosophy and viewpoint within the black community. There has certainly always been that. Nevertheless, for hundreds of years, the black community stood together to support one another in the struggle for justice. But the power and the insidiousness of this great lie has begun to erode that solidarity. And I personally witnessed an example of this just last Friday at the city's annual MLK breakfast. Hand-selected young black leaders from our public schools were invited to share their MLK essays in front of the assembled crowd. Now these hand-selected students were clearly intelligent, thoughtful, and eloquent proto-leaders. Nevertheless, I became somewhat disoriented as I listened to these hand-selected students, these hand-curated students, invoking the name and spirit of Dr. King while also explicitly and repeatedly appealing to the theme, all lives matter. Arguing that expressions of systemic and structural racism like police brutality should take a backseat to the issue of blacks addressing black on black violence. The keynote speaker was a very successful black doctor, a shining example of black exceptionalism who repeated the mantra or at least implied it that education, which is at least allegedly accessible to all, is the panacea to cure the ills of lingering inequality in our country. And I must admit that I felt immense personal dis-ease as the large assemblage of white attendees were encouraged to stand and applaud as these black leaders told their black audience that essentially all they needed to do was pull on their own bootstraps a little harder. It's not that these ideas don't have a measure of validity and utility. And I, as a white man, do not presume to critique the black community's internal dialogue about the struggle for equality, except that this wasn't really a dialogue. Only one viewpoint was being promoted, respectability politics, offered at a breakfast purportedly celebrating a revolutionary, an iconoclast, a prophet, who fearlessly spoke truth to power, was jailed, terrorized, and ultimately murdered for applying the pressure and tension of justice to the white power brokers of his day.
noticeably absent from this celebratory breakfast was any mention of the names Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, or Sandra Bland. Dr. King said, white America must recognize that justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. He also said, following the success of the civil rights movement, we moved into a new era, which must be an era of revolution. Yet today in 2016, Dr. King's full body of work, his complex and radical philosophies have tragically been simplified, reduced to a single speech, even a single quote within that speech, a dream to see his children judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. It is a quote that has been abused and applied out of context by those who would seek to co-opt Dr. King's revolutionary prophetic ministry and replace his message of a radical restructuring of society with respectability politics and the philosophy of Bill Cosby. I just don't see a 28-year-old MLK standing today with Bill O'Reilly and Glenn Beck saying, all lives matter. I believe in 2016, we are going to see a younger generation of black activists move away from respectability politics and embrace the revolutionary ideals of people like Dr. King. And I believe that all of us who claim to love justice are going to have to decide what our response will be. Along these lines, I would like to close this morning by reading the last few paragraphs from Michelle Alexander's book. If Martin Luther King Jr. is right, that the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice, a new movement will arise. And if civil rights organizations fail to keep up with the times, they will be pushed to the side as another generation of advocates comes to the fore. Hopefully, the new generation will be led by those who know best the brutality of the new caste system, a group with greater vision, courage and determination than the old guard can muster, trapped as they may be in an outdated paradigm. This new generation of activists should not disrespect their elders or disparage their contributions or achievements. To the contrary, they should bow their heads in respect for their forerunners have expended untold hours and made great sacrifices in an elusive quest for justice. But once respects have been paid, they should march right past them, emboldened, as King once said, by the fierce urgency of now. Those of us who hope to be their allies should not be surprised if and when this day comes, that when those who have been locked up and locked out finally have the chance to speak and truly be heard, what we hear is rage. The rage may frighten us, it may remind us of riots, uprisings, and buildings aflame. We may be tempted to control it or douse it with buckets of doubt, dismay, and disbelief, but we should do no such thing. Instead, when a young man who was born in the ghetto and who knows little of life beyond the walls of his prison cell and the invisible cage that has become his life turns to us in bewilderment and rage, we should do nothing more than look him in the eye and tell him the truth we should tell him the same truth the great African-American writer James Baldwin told his nephew in a letter published in 1962 in one of the most extraordinary books ever written, The Fire Next Time. With great passion and searing conviction, Baldwin had this to say to his young nephew. This is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen, and for which neither I nor time, nor history will ever forgive them, that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. It is their innocence which constitutes the crime. This innocent country set you down in a ghetto in which, in fact, it intended that you should perish. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever, 
You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. You have, and many of us have, defeated this intention. And by a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents who believed that your imprisonment made them safe are losing their grasp on reality. But these men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers. And if the word integration means anything, this is what it means, that we with love shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. Great men have done great things here and will again, and we can make America what it must become. It will be hard, but you come from sturdy peasant stock, men who picked cotton and dammed rivers and built railroads, and in the teeth of the most terrifying odds, achieved an unassailable and monumental dignity you come from a long line of great poets since Homer. One of them said, the very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. We cannot be free until they are free. God bless you and Godspeed.